Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Valley of Words, it is indeed a privilege and a rare honor for me to be moderating this session on 150 years of the United Services Institution of the USI of India, a roadmap for the future. I have with me three very distinguished panelists, Major General Ain Cardozo, Lieutenant General P.K. Singh, and Major General B.K. Sharma. More about them later. The USI was founded in 1870 by Colonel, later Major General Charles McGregor for furtherance of interest and knowledge in the art, science, and literature of the Defense Forces. It is the oldest think tank of India and has a niche expertise in national security strategy, regional geopolitical and geostrategic study, art of warfare, revolution in military affairs, asymmetric warfare, disruptive technologies, asymmetric conflicts, defense planning, force structuring, and development. The USI is an autonomous institution with over 15,000 members comprising of diplomats, bureaucrats, academicians, scholars, and officers of the security forces. It also has bilateral dialogues with similar institutions in India and abroad. The USI organizes international seminars, lectures by eminent speakers, roundtable discussions, and workshops. It has four main verticals, namely the Center for Strategic Studies and Simulation, the Center for Armed Forces Historical Research, the Center for Distance Learning Programs, and the Center for United Nations Peacekeeping. To, the USI is headed by a director. The present director is Major General B.K. Sharma. Today we have with us three distinguished panelists. They are all illustrious in their own right. Firstly, we have Major General Ain Cardozo. General Cardozo was born in Mumbai in 1937 and studied at St. Xavier's School and College. Thereafter, he joined the Joint Services Wing or the JSW in July 1954. Incidentally, he was the first cadet to win both the gold medal for being the best all-round cadet and the silver medal for being first in the order of merit. He was commissioned into the 1st Battalion of the 5th Gurkha Rifles, the Frontier Force, where he received his basic grounding as a young officer. In 1960, he was ordered, awarded a Sena Medal for Gallantry while on a patrol in Nifa. He thereafter took part in the 1962 Sino-Indian War, the 1965 Indo-Pakistan War, and the 1971 War in Bangladesh, where he was wounded and lost his leg. He overcame the disability of losing a leg and became the first disabled officer of the Indian Army to be approved for command of an infantry battalion and brigade and thereafter commanded an infantry division. On retirement, he worked in the area of disability with an NGO as vice president of the War Wounded Foundation and thereafter was appointed as chairman of the Rehabilitation Council of India, where he worked for nine years. He is currently the chairman of the Center for Armed Forces Historical Research at the USI. Next, we have Lieutenant General P.K. Singh. Lieutenant General P.K. Singh has had a very, very illustrious career. He was commissioned in the Army in December 1967 and retired as the Army Commander of the Southwestern Command in August 2008. His command assignments include command of a field regiment self-propelled, a mountain brigade in the Northeast, an infantry division on the Western sector, a corps in the plains on the Western sector, and of course, the Southwestern Command. He has been Colonel Commandant of the Regiment of Artillery, 
and apart from various prestigious courses and staff appointments which he has tenanted, he has also been an instructor at the Indian Military Academy, the School of Artillery at Delali, and the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. After retirement, he took over as director of the USI in Jan 2009 and stepped down after 11 years at the helm at December, on 31st December 2019. During this period, he worked with many institutions in an advisory capacity, was a member of the Governing Council of Indian Council of World Affairs. He has also been a member of the Rusi International UK and of the High Level Advisory Committee of the Special Center for National Security Studies at the JNU and has been closely associated with these challenges forum in Sweden and involved in setting up the International Peace Capacities Network and the effectiveness of peace operations. Finally, we have the current director, Major General B.K. Sharma, who has actually been associated with USI for the last nine years. General Sharma was commissioned into the Sikh Light Infantry in December 1976 and superannuated in 2012. He too has tenanted prestigious assignments both in India and abroad, including command of a mounted division on the China border and been a senior faculty member at the National Defense College. He has represented India as the, at the UN as a military observer in Central America and has also been India's defense attache in Central Asia. He specializes in strategic net assess assessment methodology, scenario building, and strategic gaming. He has visited over 40 countries and has been on various international delegations and educational tours and participated in over 30 international conferences abroad and several within India. Having edited eight books and contributed over 60 seminal papers, he has presented 30 research papers in international conferences and he edits the prestigious USI Strategic Yearbook and regularly participates in a track to level diplomacy. <clears throat> Today, the aim is to walk you through the history of the USI cover its organization and charter and the contribution the USI has made to the nation in the past. And we will talk about its future roadmap. To begin with, I will now ask General Ain Cardozo to tell us briefly about the history of the USI from 1870 till independence. General Ain Cardozo, sir. Thank you, General Jagadbir. Uh, you have already covered much of what I was going to say. <laughs> so anyway, as you've already said, the USI was established in 1870 by then Colonel Charles Metcalf uh, McGregor, who later on became Major General McGregor, who was a Quartermaster General of India. At that time, the USI also incorporated the back office of the military intelligence headquarters of the army because military intelligence at that time was a part of the charter of duties of the quartermaster general. Although it was modeled on the Royal Institute Service Institute of England, it had no connection with it. Its objective at that time was very simple. That is to do good to the services at large the officers, seamen, and soldiers, and the government that they served. Its patrons was the Viceroy and the Governor General of India, and its members extended from the Viceroy down to all the officers of the three services. And they included people, eminent persons, like Field Marshal Slim, John Smythe Victoria Cross, and many others, too many to name. The USI, therefore, informed its members of the changes and development of organizations in the armed forces and the changes in the weapons and equipment and world events that shaped the vision and contours of strategy of allies and adversaries so as to help its members develop strategy, tactics, weapon and equipment worldwide. It also followed up with events 
and developments that factored national strategy and the art and science of warfare. It also ensured, through the USI Journal, the growth and development of the members of the armed forces to keep them up to date. The first journal was printed in 1872 to cover the period 1871-1872. It started at that time with just 215 members and membership at that time consisted of life members and ordinary members. It has an excellent library with books covering issues of interest to all members of the armed forces. It started with a small library that has grown over the years to have a library of the best collection of books on military history, political science, linked with military thought, adventure, history of the wars and campaigns, and probably the best military history library in Asia. It, it, uh, its aim plus was to analyze military development, stimulating discussion, and spreading knowledge on military matters. It also instituted the McGregor Medal. The McGregor Medal was to be awarded to a person who conducted the best reconnaissance that enhanced the knowledge of the armed forces in furtherance of his professional role. It shifted to Delhi after independence, and the first Indian director of the USI was Colonel Pierre Lal, who contributed immensely to the USI. It moved to Delhi in Kashmir House in 1953. So at independence, there was a time that they felt that they need not, they could have a common USI between India and Pakistan, and thereafter it was separated. Can you just tell us something about this? Well, I don't know much about that. I only know that uh, it, it moved to Delhi. And uh, at that time, well, partition separated so much of India and Pakistan in various departments, and this was just one of them. Thank you. May I ask General P.K. Singh now to please tell us about the history of USI post-independence till the present day and what has been its role in as far as the government policies are concerned. Thank you very much, Jagat. Uh, with General Cardozo's permission, I just I don't know about the question you asked about uh, it being the institution, uh, the USI of India and Pakistan. Yes, a decision was taken, and both the countries had agreed that we would have one common institution called the United Service Institution of India and Pakistan. So for one year, we published the four journals with flags of both the countries on the cover, okay. showing and calling it the United Service Institution of India and Pakistan. However, right from the beginning, uh, the Pakistani Governor General uh, did not agree to be a co-patron. That was the first thing we got a hint that, that things are not okay. And a year down the line, uh, the External Affairs Ministry of Pakistan directed that uh, it is not right for them or for their officers to be or to be members of uh, foreign uh, institutions. Though they said individually they can become members, but uh, we cannot have any of these things. So the linkage broke. And obviously, you must also remember that we had fought a war by then. Yes, sir. You couldn't have been enemies and friends. So that is uh, also to be kept in mind. Now, coming to the point that you uh, asked about. Uh, when independence, we were looking at independence, there was already a thought that we'll need an Indian director. Or in, uh, those days, he was called secretary. Yes. And uh, there was, uh, you'd be surprised to know, the large heartedness and the vision of this institution, that from the day it was founded, it was founded as a uh, inter-service, joint service institution. It was not an army institution, though founded by the army. Okay. And the first secretary, of uh, was commander, lieutenant commander, later commander K.V. Cherian, who was a naval reserve officer. And he was assistant director. And on retirement in 1948, in uh, September 1948, he became the secretary and remained secretary for eight years. So the first Indian is a naval officer who was headed USI. And so far, he's the only uh, officer other than from the army who was headed this institution. How do I look at his tenure? His tenure was marked by winding up the USI at Shimla, trying to move it to Delhi, not knowing where he'll be put up in Delhi, where will we have the thing. So he had a very difficult job. And more importantly, he had to wind up our property in uh, Shimla. So we sold off our uh, property in Shimla and the USI was uh, there because we had no money. 
actually money has been a problem uh, right from the day it was founded it has been we had you will be surprised to know that in one of the minutes of the meeting it was recorded that if we run out of money we will merge with rusi fortunately okay. we never ran out of money because we kept getting little bit of money here to publish journal or something of that sort so that never happened so so cherian moved the institution set it up in kashmir house and kept it going doing what looking at the library looking at the journal journal did not stop publication even for one issue in the 150 years the journal is meant to be the oldest journal of in india as far as in, in asia in one of the yeah. oldest in the world and uh, so that carried on and the lectures carried on so the legacy he maintained after him came uh, he left in uh, i told totally you he left in 1956 this is 31st december 56 then colonel uh, pyaralal who was still in service became a part time secretary and remained part time secretary till he retired from the army his last appointment was uh, colonel gios of the ndc he was in for a long long time uh, um, uh, so uh, he took over and he became full time secretary after retirement in 1972 and then became director and editor uh, 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 of the usi it it is to his credit that he kept the institution going full steam we had the journal we had the library we used to have regular talks we had the essay competitions all that carried on and he was a man full of energy unfortunately he died in harness and uh, he was succeeded by major general samir sena who became the director general samir sena continued with all the activities but he started focusing on getting a building getting land for the usi so he put all his energy into reaching out to the prime minister to the chiefs and everybody that we should be given land <coughs> and we should give money so his single biggest contribution was getting the land getting the building and once we moved into the usi present premises in uh, june 1996 he said it's time for me to go so in 30th june 1996 he left and he was succeeded by general uh, satish nambiar so general satish nambiar now we had moved into a new place we had place we had scope to grow and now was the time to look at how to grow the institution and that is the time we went in uh, we had just established a center for research in the end of 1995 knowing that building is now coming up so let's start research so general nambiar had the vision to say we must grow and the services were wholly supportive of the usi then i can't say it of now but i am to later on because there was no other institution so the army navy air force everyone supported the usi and all the chiefs wanted it to grow so the institution came in and with the help and the the support of the three services the center for research was made into center for strategic studies and simulation in 2005 10 years after it was established a center for armed forces historical research was established in december 2000 a center for un peacekeeping was established in 2000 so we established three new centers uh great vision great thing that now we must move and as i told you services were supporting us and they gave little money the only problem is they did not give us enough to grow institutions need money and there was no way we could have been generating money by writing papers and so we started eating into our corpus and that remained a problem and the second problem was once they started making their own think tanks the uh, the interest started uh, waning but that's a separate issue it didn't make a difference to us we carried on so general nambiar i must give full marks to him for having this vision and for setting up these centers which actually started growing and our footprint started increasing a general nambiar left on 31st december to, uh, 2008 and i took over on 1st january 2009 so here i was with an institution which had great centers which had an outreach now which had so my task i looked around what is it that i wanted to do and i got the help and support from all senior officers like general carter and so many others who told me and with their guidance we realized that we need to go more international we need to have more substance we need to look into new subjects not just carry on on the old subjects so what is it that we really did i'll very briefly say the uh, i'll start with the uh, center for distance learning as you call it probably called the courses section because that is the oldest it has been functioning from 1903 providing education to officers from 1903 in 1958 we started doing the formal courses for the promotion examinations and for the competitive examinations for the civil defense services staff college and the technical staff college 
So that is the oldest center. And uh, to give an idea of what uh, we have been really uh, uh, doing, you must understand that in the last say 10 odd years, can you make a guess how many officers we have trained? Over 23,000 officers who have gone through us for their promotion examinations and competitive examinations. That is the time. There was a time when we had over 3,500 officers joining the forces. So we have done human service. So anybody, whether you're sitting in Siachen or you're sitting in Delhi, you are able to be guided, coached, helped to do your promotion exam. That's been a great service. The second center, which is the oldest center, is a center for armed forces historical research, as I told you, founded in 2000. Now, this center uh, initially had projects coming to it. it. It was given the task of revising or going through the 1962 official history and the, 19, uh, uh, sorry, and the 1971 war. So the revision of the official history was done by the USI. And thereafter, they were, the USI was tasked to bring out a definitive uh, book on the India's role in peacekeeping, which General Satish Nambia brought out. So this is a major thing. And then we start saying, hey, what next now? Where is it? And uh, with Rana Chinna, with the other officers over here, we said, we must tell the world what India did. And I looked around and said, hey, 100 years of uh, the First World War is coming up in 2014. It'll take us a couple of years to get the support. So we started focusing on looking at uh, what we will do for the India and the Great War Centenary mm -hmm. Commemoration. Mm -hmm. That was a very ambitious project. Fortunately, we were supported by the NU wholeheartedly. A four-year project in which we told the world what we're going to vote it in, in the First World War. In the meantime, we also brought out a book about war memorials to of Indian soldiers throughout the world, again supported by the MEA. Now that was except that gave the MEA uh, feeling that this is an institution which can we can use for public diplomacy. So they started supporting us more and more. And when we were doing this project uh, uh, about the this uh, great centenary commemoration, uh, uh, first world war commemoration, hundred years of this thing, an idea occurred to us, and this was there because the French supported it. We wanted to build a memorial in France. Now, sitting in Delhi, we were able to reach out and link up with a small commune of a village called uh, Ville, Ville, um, uh, Ville. And the, the mayor there gave us land. He said, we'll give it to you free. Come and make a memorial. I remember meeting him and he said, had it not been for Indian troops, we would have been speaking German. That was a great thing. And he said, I'm so happy that you're going to make a memorial. So we were getting land in France, making the memorial in India, Ram Sutta, the famous architect, the sculptor, he made it for us. And we didn't know how to ship it. We didn't understand the problem. Air India helped us, MEA helped us. We shipped the thing from here to France, supervised this construction sitting here, and of course with Jarana Chinna and General Goswami going there and seeing it. And finally it was inaugurated in November 2018 <clears throat> by the Vice President in France, and I had the privilege of representing the USA and conducting all the people over there. So that was there. So that also led us to say, hey, we, there is, that got the others interested. The British got interested. The Austrians got interested. The uh, Belgians got interested. Hey, how about doing something with us? So we did, with, the next one was a project with the Belgians. We did the project and then they said they'll have an exhibition in India. The king and queen of Belgium came and inaugurated that. From there we said, hey, if we can do this, why not do a battlefield tour. The Belgians said, can you do it for us? The French said, can you make a battlefield tour? We made that, gave it to them. So from there, we moved on like that. So we were able to fulfill the mission of showcasing what the Indians did. Now we said, hey, if we can do this there, why not do something here? So the idea of the staff ride, which is the thing which the Americans do, to study campaigns and military history campaigns and war campaigns, they go on the ground. So we did that. We did a small one of 1857 in Delhi to understand, can we do it? When we were very comfortable that we can do it, we said we will do the Battle of Cham. General Cardozo has been the GOC of Tendiv. General Cardozo with General Sandhu, who wrote the book on the Battle of Cham, carried out the staff ride. That is, on the ground you go. And the 65 and 71 operations of Cham were down the ground. And that is the thing we, I hope, more uh, carries on. From there, we said, hey, why not Battle of Kohima, Battle of Imphal? So we started joining up over there. From there, I think that we're doing all this outside. Why not within the country? So we went on to say, let's do the project called India Remembers. So we did a project within the country for six months, telling every part of our country, the students, the villages, everywhere to say, India remembers whom? The soldier. 
a very successful project. So when we said, hey, this has happened, then somebody pointed out to us, it was Rana Chenna, if I remember correctly, who said, sir, the Indian Labour Corps gets no mention. We talk of Indian Army. Indian Labour Corps was separate. And it stayed on in Europe. It was not allowed to come out till it demined and it filled all those trenches, etc. No recognition. So we said, we'll do something for the Indian Labour Corps. We did a big program and did a wreath laying at India Gate. And it was linked to the wreath laying in UK. So the Indian Labour Corps people got to know. The Northeast states were very happy that we did this because most of the Labour Corps came from the Northeast, which most of the Indians didn't know also. So we, one thing led to the other. And then came, the, I'll just uh, end on uh, this because I can go on and on because there's such thing and General Cardoza hits the center. But two things more happened. One was to say that there is a need for having, why should we only wear the poppy? So uh, it was uh, said that, hey, we should be having an Indian flower. And the marigold was taken as Indian flower available throughout the year. Everybody understand again, they got pulled marigold, marigold for flower. Now that has become the symbol and everywhere from 2016, we have the marigold representing us as the uh, the last thing is about you know what we have done with the the uh, british you know uh, the, what we have done with the british indian military heritage partnership we've gone into because we have a heritage there is a heritage linkage between the indian army and the british army so we have gone in there and we have started a new thing which no one else does in the country is to conduct the uh, what is it called the military museum curator sports Nowhere else in Asia is it done. We are doing that. We have done the second one. So this is what the, these two centers did. Coming to Center for Strategic Studies and Simulation, this is the heart, the think tank part of it. The one which does the linkages with the world, uh, which has uh, tires, which is... So I will not talk about what all others do. Let me tell you what it does, which no one else does. And that, as uh, uh, you mentioned earlier about General Sharma, was we do net assessment, which nobody else does. We do strategic uh, gaming exercises for the NDC, for the Services War College, for the Police Academy. Uh, we also went to Oman and did it. We went to Singapore. So we do that. Again, nobody else does it. So that's the second thing which we uh, do. Then we said, hey, we must hold an international conference. In 2009, we looked around and said, what is it? And, and I said, China will remain our adversary. It will remain on our borders. We'll have problems. We don't know enough about China. We don't know about the Indo-Pacific on the ocean thing. So from 2009, we hold an international conference every year looking at the Indo-Pacific, basically looking at China. And in 11 years, I mentored that as director with the help of my CSP and General Sharma and all of this. And that has a prestigious event in which people from all over the world come and attend. Um, the, the other thing which we did was to bring out the annual strategic uh, yearbook from 2016. People don't write, don't read. So this annual strategic yearbook has been bought out, apart from uh, what we do on Facebook and what we do anything else over here. Uh, we also reached out to the universities and started going there to talk about strategic issues and then started a, a program for internship for undergraduates and postgraduates. So we had the skits coming to us. That's what the CS3 does. We also realized that we need to showcase India has more talent. It's not that the director or the deputy director of the search who's there. We have hundreds of people who are on, talented, who must be shown to the world that we have that talent. This nonsense about India doesn't have strategic culture had to be changed. You'll be surprised to know in the last one decade, we sent over 100 officers abroad. People like General Sherman, I've been a number of times, but all other officers also have been. We sent 100 different officers on different subjects. So there is the thing here, they say, hey, there are a large number of experts. Who says there is no strategic thinking in the country? Look at them. We sent officers, serving officers for nuclear conferences. We sent them for, uh, for uh, special forces conferences. And so that, now to say that, oh, what are you also doing any research? The center, the CS3 brought out 166 books and monographs, 166 books and monographs. No other institution has done in a decade and signed 34 MOUs. It's not we reached out, seeing our outreach the international think tanks started coming to us and saying, we want to be your partner. We signed 34 MOUs of international uh, uh, things. Coming to the last thing, I will just talk about the Center for Peacekeeping. As I told you, it was established in the year 2000. For 14 years, we nurtured it. It became a center, uh, a globally recognized center of excellence. It has moved out of the USI because it became a unit of its own after a fire incident over in the USI. But even when they were here, I realized that we are looking at training at the tactical level 
So we said we need to look around at the strategic and the policy level. So simultaneously, we reached out to the UN, we reached out to other institutions and said we also can contribute towards policy in peacekeeping. We are the founding members of three international groupings. We went to the UN. Uh, you all must be knowing about the HOTA panel, which was the high level panel, which was done for review. We requested Mr. Hota. He came to USI with his deputy <laughs> and General Abhijit Goa, who is also a member of the USI, an officer from management. They came here and then we sent them recommendations. Before that, we got hold of former force commanders and serving force commanders to say, let's get our ideas together. We got ideas from them and we got ideas from Indian blueberries. And I sent a letter to the HOTA panel giving the India's position on peacekeeping. We also reached out to the UN women to say, hey, we need to look around at issues about women. So we had, uh, you know, uh, been doing, but one more thing I want to say, we were hesitant about responsibility to protect. You know, we would shy away. We didn't want to talk. We would go and meet the ME and say, we should be seen. <laughs> we want to be a member of the C uh, of the uh, um, uh, BFP5, be on the Security Council. We need to, we can't shy away from any topic. So with their permission, we started sending officers to attend the responsibility to protect meets. And finally, the MEA agreed and said, USI should host an international conference on responsibility to protect. We did that. That was the first time we acknowledged a responsibility to protect. And the secretary from the MEA came and gave a talk. So that was acknowledged as a thing that we, we, are, we are not shying away from uh, anything. Um, I have taken a long time. One last thing I want to tell you about is, uh, you know, do we do something different? Something else? Yes. We also looked around and said we should do look at uh, 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 this issue of uh, uh, what is it? Um, glacier studies. So we went to look around and said glacier melting of glaciers, the snout measurement. We went over here. They said nobody has got the snout measurement. So from 2010 to 2012, we carried out, we sent out small teams supported by the army to the glaciers. And which all we did we go? We went to uh, Gangotri and Siachin in 2010, to Kolahoi in 2011, to Baspa and Bada Singri in 2012. We measured the snout, fixed the snout, came and gave back data to the ministry over here. And they were very grateful that the USI can do it. Unfortunately, we can't carry on doing it forever. And the, we are the only institution which has also set up the solar panel. Uh, we have, we have we've got solar panel going. 270 k, k, KW is being generated from solar panel. And I must give credit to one person, Colonel P.S. Gill. Colonel Gill's son died in an Air, Air Force. He's my coachman and dear friend from India. His son died in a MIG crash. And he said, I, 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 know, I don't want the money that I got from this, I mean, this insurance, et cetera, et cetera. What is it I can do? So I suggested, uh, would you like to think of a chair? He, he and his wife straight away agreed and gave 20 lakhs to establish here. 20 lakhs to establish a chair in the name of his son. The money he has given is more than what the services and the ministries gave to establish chairs. And the first book was written by Air Marshal Bharat Kumar, which was released in 2018, but then uh, the Marshal of the Air Force, the iconic Marshal of the Air Force, Arjun Singh, released the first book. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, sir. Here to, like, Thank you. The uh, thing that we have done over here. General BK, sir, can I ask you your association with USI before becoming the director? You said you've been here nine years. It's one of the most prestigious think tanks. So how, what do you see are the challenges and opportunities facing USI? And what are the transformation pathways you're likely to undertake now that you've become the director? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, uh, I must express my thanks to Shri Sanjeev Chopra, the honorary curator of Valley of Words, who has honored uh, my request to schedule this special episode. Much about the USI's past and what has happened in the recent times has been very well brought out by Journal Cardozo and by my mentor, Journal P.K. Singh. And they have amply brought out, you know, the unique uh, multidisciplinary character of uh, the USI vis-a-vis -vis other think tanks. My association with USI is about 43 years old when I became its life members. And then I remember the day when General P.K. Singh took me under his wings soon after my uh, super renovation from the service. And he said, 
uh, who knows that one day you will be the director of this uh, institution. I still remember those words. Well, that was never where, then nowhere in my reckoning, but as the events unfolded, today I happen to be the director of this prestigious institution. So this nine years of association has given me a very good insight into the U USI ethos, its work culture, stance, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And at the 150 years of its raising now, I'm in a position probably to put my own contribution and see that how we can maintain the legacy of this institution and put it on the path of transformation. First, I would say that uh, this whole uh, beginning of 150 years of celebration, it has a uh, lot of uh, contribution from General Cardozo and General P.K. Singh. And despite this corona period, we are going to do a documentary on McGregor's medal. We've already done some book releases. There are some special publications which we are taking. Particularly, we are going to synthesize selected articles from 150 years of uh, publication of USI Journal. And we are also taking out a commemorative issue which will have articles written by our two previous directors, that is Journal Nambiar and Journal P.K. Singh, and also uh, the other heads of uh, uh, different departments. We are releasing a postage stamp, and there is a wreath-laying ceremony of being organized at the War Memorial. And in continuation with our tradition, we would also be holding a special uh, webinar or seminar on national security. This notwithstanding, the USI has some unique challenges and the biggest challenge that we face is the financial crunch. USI being a council and we are very uh, fond of for our ethos of autonomy in thinking and functioning. And that creates a problem in terms of getting financial aid from outside uh, sources. And that impedes our ability to induct multidisciplinary re research talent into the institution. We have the sort of our talent, we have the capacity, but we are a little bit handicapped. Another problem that has come up that General PK explained that every service has uh, raised its own think tank and even headquarter ideas has raised San Jose. And therefore, we have to compete with them. All of them are getting aids and grants, but we are not getting any money. Likewise, large number of other think tanks which are being privately funded or funded by ministries have come up. So USI has very stiff competition in the knowledge domain today. Uh, now we are into an era of uh, digitization and most of these modern think tanks, they have uh, Adap ad 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 adapted to digitization. Uh, and this is going to be a major challenge. How do we sort of uh, imbibe a digital uh, technology and uh, transform USI? Uh, we had uh, embarked upon a number of initiatives, but this corona has really impacted us very badly and some of these things are actually moving at a slow pace. But in the meanwhile, there are a number of opportunities which are staring us in the face. And one is that we are in the process of using, uh, sort of creating USI chapters. For example, I've already tied up with IIT Madras and we will be creating a chapter there that would take care of all the members of Southern India. Then we also doing joint events now with DG, DG Assam Rifles. They funded a chair and we would be carrying, uh, conducting a memorial lecture. And we also offered membership to their officers. A new chair of excellence has been offered to us by War Wounded Rehabilitation Chair. And that is funded by War Wounded Foundation, under which we would be doing broader work for war wounded for their rehabilitation and their contribution to the society. As General P.K. Singh explained, this Center for Military History and Conflict Studies is today has emerged as a prima donna in terms of providing consultancy in the National War Museum. Uh, we also got offers for the digitization of Indian Army history and its archives. 
we've been approached by Ministry of External Affairs to curate, plan, and conduct the grand victory of celebrations for 1971 war. And we also made a proposal to set up for India a military heritage trust. As far as Center for Strategic Studies and Stimulation is concerned, we are, you know, the leaders in net assessment at the national level and also a node of excellence for scenario building and strategic gaming. We've now been approached by DRDO to develop a model for national level strategic gaming and we are working in tandem with them. We've also emerged very recently as a node of excellence for hired learning for our senior officers of the three services. We are now conducting a joint mentorship capsule uh, for the three services. Then they've also asked us to conduct the core program for the two star and three star as you are aware. In addition to that, we also becoming a node of excellence for defense diplomacy. There is a proposal to conduct an average form of National Defense College, what we call is an executive NDC course for about foreign officers from 30 countries. In addition to that, there is another course that we would be conducting and that is International Strategic Security and Defense Management Program for foreign officers. We are in the process of, you know, uh, uh, introducing the e-learning for the career progression courses, the part B, D, and staff college. And General PK at length has spoken about the UN peacekeeping. Uh, we are in the process of, uh, you know, reviving that USI becomes a center of excellence to deal with the peacekeeping operations related to policy and doctrinal issues. And we are in the process of networking with the Challengers Forum and that Forum for Effectiveness of Policy, uh, Peace uh, Operations and Research Network. And we would be writing certain policy papers and probably present this paper at the International Forum. Now, our vision for the USI was articulated in 2005, what we called as Vision Paper 2020. Of course, a lot of things have changed and there is a need to sort of uh, uh, revisit and uh, reframe this vision and we are in the process of making a new vision paper which essentially entails consolidation of USI as a track 1.5 institution with a niche for multidisciplinary research and narrative building in comprehensive national security in a wider geopolitical context while preserving its rich heritage and un unique character as India's think tanks. And together with my team and with the help of USI Governing Council, we've already listed certain transformation pathways. And the first and foremost in that is resource regeneration. A USI Council delegation would be meeting Raksha Mantri, the Chief of Defense Staff, the Service Chief. We're also looking for more chairs of excellence and certain sponsors so that we get little more money and we are able to induct uh, more talent into the USI. We are in the process of aligning and collaborating with National Security Council, DRDO, and other service headquarters and training establishment of the military as also with other think tanks in India and abroad. Our focus as far as military history is going to concern, we've done a yeoman service for pre-independence era, era, both the First World War and the Second World War. Now we would be focusing more and more on post-independence wars and conflicts. We are in the process of converting USI Journal into an e-format and then promote it on Amazon. Uh, we already started making focus policy papers because a lot of changes have taken place in the recent past as far as you know our military force structuring and development and reorganization uh, is concerned so we are writing a lot of policy papers on these contemporary national security issues and of course with the help of drdo maybe one day we would be establishing this national strategic gaming center wherein it is going to be an interdisciplinary inter-ministry, inter-agency kind of an approach to st strategic and scenario gaming. 
We have embarked upon a visibility and outreach program through digitization. Uh, we activated our Facebook page, our Twitter handle, our uh, YouTube platforms. Uh, we starting, started sending this fortnightly updates to our members wherein we have handpicked papers from very prestigious foreign magazines and journals as also our publications and the links to YouTube episodes which we have been doing. Uh, we are in the process of reaching out to IS Academy, Police Academy, Foreign Services Institute, foreign missions here and universities in India and abroad. One more initiative uh, that we have taken is production and propagation of digital knowledge content. And we are doing this strategic insight series with Nitin Gokhale. These have become extremely popular in which we get our resource faculty and they talk about this current strategic affairs issue. But we also started now, and this was General PK's idea, have a USI strategic dialogue uh, that we would be generating and uploading it on YouTube from time to time, wherein we will use our own talent and some of our council members. We gone into a memorandum of understanding with Peninsula Studio and also British High Commission and they produce this wonderful Brain Trust series. So we are going to produce exclu exclusive Brain Trust series for the USI, which would be propagated nationally and internationally. Our website is still not up to the mark, so we are in the process of making it uh, mobile friendly and enhance our outreach to other think tanks. Presently, we have these track 1.5 dialogues with about three uh, partners like Afghanistan, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. So we are reaching out to some more people and uh, expand the scope. And lastly, we, would, we have already conducted during General PK's time about four projects with foreign collaborators and published books. So we are reaching out to foreign think tanks uh, to do some more joint projects. Uh, you would be very happy to know that in last about three or four months, we've done 11 web webinars with foreign uh, think tanks, including with Rand and Hudson Institution. And uh, last thing I've been told by Executive Council to embark, embark upon this uh, membership drive during General PK's time, we had opened this membership to special civilian members, and that has picked up a little momentum, and we are going to further give it a more push so that with the passage of time, we are able to uh, sort of uh, create a niche for the USI and make this as India's premium and oldest think tank in letter and spirit. And we need your good wishes and of course the blessing and uh, mentoring and guidance of my predecessors. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd now like uh, to ask General Cardozo two quick questions, sir. Firstly, uh, General BK has already talked about it, but I suppose you will be responsible for the 1971 Golden Jubilee celebrations and you yourself having been a war veteran and wounded at that, so what are your plans for the 1971 Golden Jubilee presentation? And the second question relates to the McGregor Medal, sir. You're from the 5th Gorkha Rifles. I've been through the list of the recipients of this, and four of them happen to be from your regiment, sir. But uh, what we've been reading lately about two reckeys which are linked to the Chinese conflict which is going on now is one by Captain Rajinder Nath and one by a Major Basera, which went across, they don't figure in these medals. Sir. Any idea on that, sir? Firstly, with regards to 1971, as both the directors have already mentioned, uh, our greatest support to what happened in World War I has been the Ministry of External Affairs. There have, they have been our strength. We could do what we did, and we did so much because of the strength and support financially and otherwise by the Ministry of External Affairs. We've been talking about 1971 for a long time, and we've been submitting our reports and our proposals to the Ministry of Defense, and they are still considering what can be done 
and what support they will give us. It is now October 2020. It's two months for the 2021 to start, and we have yet to get a nod of approval from the Ministry of Defense. However, notwithstanding that, we are on our own doing some things which uh, we can do on our own without their help. And we are publishing two illustrative stories about the Parambi Chakra earned in 1971 and an illustrative story about Sam Manikshaw. And I am writing a book of short stories of the 1971 in collaboration with Penguin. So uh, there is a need for the Ministry of Defense to extend a helping hand to help us to help them to achieve their aims and to achieve the aims of this country to commemorate a war, which was a victory unprecedented in military history when we won a war within 14 days. So that is as far as 1971 stands. The McGregor Medal, thank you for talking about my own regiment. Yes, Zoru Bakshi was one of them. And uh, I don't know whether people know, he disguised himself as a monk and went across charting uncharted places in beyond in the Kashmir, China and Pakistan border and was given the mega medal. He's one of the highest decorated army soldiers of the Indian army. He is an MBC, he's a VRC, he's a PVSM, he is a VSM and Mega Medal. Yes, so I am not aware as to why these two officers, Basera and Sharma, have not got their, uh, we will consider them and we'll look into it and we'll see what can be done. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> General PK, sir, uh, General BK Sharma has alluded to these think tanks being set up by the service headquarters, including IDS, you have St. George. You also have IDSA, which is your neighbor, sir. So what are the linkages between all these think tanks? How do you re retain your autonomy? And how have uh, you felt that you're in a unique position to influence government policy? And coupled with this, uh, I read in your biography that you've also been part of the governing council of ICWA, which is the MEA think tank. Whereas conversely, they are not part of our body as such. So what do you have to say about this? Sir? How do they function differently from us? Or how do we retain a preeminent position? Thank you, Jagat. I think we need to understand that uh, the ICWA is mandated by an act of parliament. So it has been set up by an act of parliament and they get their funding separately. There. So they have that backing. Who's the one who takes uh, the, who chairs their meeting? The vice president of India chairs the meetings. The foreign minister sits there, the foreign secretary sits there. So they have no problem of getting funding. They've got no problem of outreach. Every embassy in the world says, go to ICWA. And so the, the basic point is, do you have the support of the ministry or of any service? And do you have money? So ICWA has it. So let's look at it. So they also want to reach out to other, uh, to get ideas from others. And that is how they constitute their, uh, their governing council. Their governing council has people from the IITs, from the universities, individuals who have, are known for uh, their strategy thinking. They try to get them, but they, do they really take any input from them? No, I was there for many, many years for, uh, as a thing. You said something, but finally they did what they wanted to do and they did what the ministry wanted to do. As far as the, um, the IDSA is concerned, IDSA was set up in 1965. Now let me tell you, anyone who calls himself a strategic thinker has actually cut his teeth at the USI. They all had been in the USI. Mr. Subramaniam used to be a member of the council. So everybody was here as a member of the council. Are you aware there was a time when three retired service chiefs had stood for elections and were members of our council? That was the standing of the USI because there was no one else. So the services wanted to bring up this institution. I, IDSA took a lot of ideas from us. Look, uh, you know, they looked at our charter, looked at it. They got service officers, by the way. The deputy was a service officer. And later on, Commodore um, uh, uh, was the head of the institution. So what is their strength? They get full funding and support from the MOD. Look at their campus, look at our campus, look at their funding. Does the director have worry about the money? Answer is no. 
90 people, any number of people they can call. Same thing now. You know, the other the people abroad would tell you, we want to come to USI, but your embassy says, no, go to IDSA or go to so and so institution. So nobody is there pushing for us. And that has happened, as I mentioned earlier. Yes, it was, we had a vision for joint friendship. I, am, I have written, I had, actually I have written to the prime minister when I was director that please revisit this. We look at the joint friendship. Do we need those? They, yes, we should have them, but they can be vectors of the USI. Claws and senjors and all should become, you know, it hasn't happened, but it will happen if you really want it to happen. Funding, uh, we all, BK has also talked of it, I talked of it. Do you know when the, the other four service think tanks have got 11 crores each from the ministry, we haven't got 11 rupees. So we are eating into our corpus. BK's problem and my problem, my entire problem in my 11 years was funding. We went up our funding till we got projects from abroad. The Europeans and the Americans used to give us projects and we got a lot of money. But a stage came and they started saying India is now an economic power. It will not get money, we'll give to poorer countries, not to you. And secondly, they started saying, you must bring money to the table. Now, that's where we lose out. Are people interested in coming here? The answer is yes. Uh, but uh, I don't even... So there's nobody who's anywhere, anywhere who's not been part of the USI. And I think everybody is there. And I think we need to look around. Uh, as BK says, I think we're looking around to reorganize these think tanks. And if the services want to say, they'll have to decide on one think tank and say, this is it, and others will be its, uh, you know, Victor. Thank you, sir. I think that's the key, sir. There has to be one think tank that is part of the government, as so to say, which retains its autonomy simultaneously. Same way, General BK, sir. There are also private think tanks which are operating in Delhi, like the URF and the Delhi Policy Group. So what are your interactions with people like this? And how do your papers and your research work compare with the outputs that they bring out? And how are you structured differently to them? apart from the training you have done, sir. And one question related to the training, which I have found uh, while going through this, sir, is it's mainly focused on the Army and Navy, and it's very little to be with the Air Force, sir. So if you can just highlight these points, sir. We have interaction with all think tanks, and uh, we do attend each other's events there. But uh, you look at uh, their scope, and uh, the source of their funding. So their uh, focus is entirely different vis-a-vis -vis USI. We are a membership-based society, and our primary purpose was to uh, sort of uh, enlighten and educate our armed forces officers, you know. And that is why a lot of our effort goes into historical research, career progression, and training of NDC, the higher command courses, and all. Those people do not have their, those en encumbrances. You compare the faculty at, say, ORF. They have near, more than 100 researchers. IDSA has uh, nearly about uh, 85 uh, to 90 researchers. We have only about 10 odd researchers because we do not have money. So, therefore, we cannot really compare ourselves with them. But the range of activities that we undertake, no other th think tank in India or abroad is capable of doing, doing it. But recently what we've done is that uh, besides the normal uh, interaction with these think tanks, we are signing a memorandum of understanding with ICWA. It is going to be signed on 11th of uh, this month. And we would be doing certain projects together, particularly in the domain of military history. Likewise, I've already proposed to Director IDSA, and he's agreed to this idea, that at least once in a quarter, we should be doing joint uh, projects together and pitch it at the strategic level, you know, uh, not at the uh, riffraff kind of our discussions or policy papers, but at a, at a higher strategic level. The moment we get money and we have more talent, probably we would be in a position to not only compete, but overtake some of these think tanks because we have that DNA and we have that heritage. It is just a matter of time that with a little bit of more money, we would be able to actually ch charter a very new trajectory for the USI. In regard, to, in regard to the progression of this courses for the Air Force, they don't put too much of focus on their uh, promotion exams and uh, their uh, uh, staff college. 
So therefore, there is no such thing like that. But I met uh, Chief of Air Staff uh, on two occasions very recently. So they are going to fund some more chairs and also put some of their officers on study leave. In regard to their other officers, they are part and parcel of all the programs of jointmanship that we do. Air Force officers, they do participate, but they have not yet started, you know, the staff college or its equivalent for their service. Thank Can you, I, sir. With your permission. Sir. Jagat, uh, I, I think it's not known that the ORF, when it did the Raisina dialogue for the first time, it had a number of meetings with us at the USI and wanted to know how to conduct a conference. And for the first event, we were their knowledge partners. Sure. So we guided them. Having picked up that, they have, I mean, they don't need us anymore. So that what? is how it is. As far as the books and all are published, you haven't it been seen by anybody. The publications of the USI stand out compared to the others. That, okay. That's exactly what I was getting at, sir. You have 150 years of experience behind you, sir. The uh, last thing is, everyone turns around and asks, how many PhD scholars do you have to tell them in the army we don't have time to do PhD? You know, uh, we, we are like the Americans have professors uh, uh, who are colonel, they are, they are professors. Colonels and generals are called professors uh, and brought in there. We don't have that system. So we want a stamp of PhD. By the time you get your PhD, they said, oh, ORF has 10 PhD, 20 PhDs, or IDSA has. So we have to break that also. I hope when we have the National Defense University coming up, and I wrote and fought for it that we should not insist on PhD. The Lord, our only PhD, then by the time we get PhD, we're out of that. I think that's the thing also we need to look at. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much, sir. I, at the end, I'm, it's clearly emerged that the USI stands out as a think tank for a holistic approach on to research and on a wide ranging institution. I mean, the activities have been extremely wide ranging. They organize training on strategic thoughts for pre all premium establishments, conduct strategic simulation games in India and abroad, and conduct distant learning programs. And of course, you've all heard in detail about their contribution to the historical research as far as not only India, but I've, in today we've well learned, it's almost, you can say, in the Commonwealth, sir, this historical research which has been conducted. It's been a very, very educative session for me and most enlightening. And I thank General Cardozo, General P.K. Singh, and General B.K. Sharma. And on behalf of everyone, I thank Mr. Shiv Kunal Verma and Mr. Sanjeev Chopra and the organizers of WOW for organizing this session. Thank you very much, sir. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>